Chapter Seventeen of Lorna Doone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lorna Doone by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter Seventeen. John is clearly bewitched. To forget one's luck of life, to forget the cark of care and withering of young fingers, not to feel or not to be moved by all the change of thought and heart from large young heat to the sinewy lines and dry bones of old age. This is what I have to do, ere ever I can make you know, even as a dream is known, how I loved my Lorna. I myself can never know, never can conceive or treat it as a thing of reason, never can behold myself dwelling in the midst of it, and think that this was I, neither can I wander far from perpetual thought of it. Perhaps I have two farrows of pigs ready for the chapman, perhaps I have ten stones of wool waiting for the factor, it is all the same. I look at both, and what I say to myself is this. Which would Lorna choose of them? Of course, I am a fool for this. Any man may call me so, and I will not quarrel with him, unless he guess my secret. Of course, I fetch my wit, if it be worth the fetching, back again to business. But there my heart is, and must be. And all who like to try can cheat me, except upon parish matters. That week I could do little more than dream and dream and rove about, seeking by perpetual change to find the way back to myself. I cared not for the people round me, neither took delight in victuals, but made believe to eat and drink, and blushed at any questions. And being called the master now, head farmer and chief yeoman, it irked me much that any one should take advantage of me. Yet everybody did so as soon as ever it was known that my wits were gone moon-raking. For that was the way they looked at it, not being able to comprehend the greatness and the loftiness. Neither do I blame them much, for the wisest thing is to laugh at people when we cannot understand them. I, for my part, took no notice, but in my heart despised them as beings of a lesser nature, who never had seen Lorna. Yet I was vexed and rubbed myself when John Fry spread all over the farm, and even at the shoeing forge, that a mad dog had come and bitten me from the other side of Malond. This seems little to me now, and so it might to any one, but at the time it worked me up to a fever of indignity to make a mad dog of Lorna, to compare all my imaginings, which were strange, I do assure you, the faculty not being apt to work, to count the raising of my soul no more than hydrophobia. All this acted on me so that I gave John Fry the soundest threshing that ever a sheaf of good corn deserved, or a bundle of tares was blessed with. Afterwards he went home, too tired to tell his wife the meaning of it, but it proved of service to both of them, and an example to their children. Now the climate of this country is, so far as I can make of it, to throw no man into extremes, and if he throw himself so far, to pluck him back by change of weather, and the need of looking after things, lest we should be like the southerns, for whom the sky does everything, and men sit under a wall and watch both food and fruit come beckoning. Their sky is a mother to them, but ours a good stepmother to us, fearing to hurt by indulgence, and knowing that severity and change of mood are wholesome. The spring being now too forward, a check to it was needful, and in the early part of March there came a change of weather. All the young growth was arrested by a dry wind from the east, which made both face and fingers burn when a man was doing ditching. The lilacs and the woodbines, just crowding forth in little tufts, close kerneling their blossom, were ruffled back like a sleeve turned up, and nicked with brown at the corners. In the hedges any man, unless his eyes were very dull, could see the mischief doing. The russet of the young elm-bloom was fain to be in scale again, but having pushed forth there must be, and turned to a tawny colour. The hangers of the hazel, too, having shed their dust to make the nuts, did not spread their little combs and dry them as they ought to do, but shrivelled at the base and fell as if a knife had cut them. And more than all to notice was, at least about the hedges, the shuddering of everything, and the shivering sound among them toward the feeble sun such as we make to a poor fireplace, when several doors are open. Sometimes I put my face to warm against a soft, rough maple stem, which feels like the foot of a red deer, but the pitiless east wind came through all, and took and shook the caved hedge aback till its knees were knocking together, and nothing could be shelter. Then would any one, having blood and trying to keep it home with it, run to a sturdy tree and hope to eat his food behind it, and look for a little sun to come and warm his feet in the shelter. And if it did, he might strike his breast and try to think he was warmer. But when a man came home at night, after a long day's labour, 
knowing that the days increased and so his care should multiply, still he found enough of light to show him what the day had done against him in his garden. Every ridge of new-turned earth looked like an old man's muscles, honeycombed and standing out void of spring and powdery. Every plant that had rejoiced in passing such a winter now was cowering, turned away, unfit to meet the consequence. Flowing sap had stopped its course, fluted lines showed want of food, and if you pinched the topmost spray there was no rebound or firmness. We think a good deal in a quiet way when people ask us about them, of some fine upstanding pear trees grafted by my grandfather, who had been very greatly respected, and he got those grafts by sheltering a poor Italian soldier in the time of James I, a man who never could do enough to show his grateful memories. How he came to our place is a very difficult story, which I never understood rightly, having heard it from my mother. At any rate, there the pear trees were, and there they are to this very day, and I wish every one could taste their fruit, old as they are, and rugged. Now these fine trees had taken advantage of the west winds and the moisture, and the promise of the springtime, so as to fill the tips of the spray wood and the rowels all up the branches with a crowd of eager blossom. Not that they were yet in bloom, nor even showing whiteness, only that some of the cones were opening at the side of the cap which pinched them, and there you might count perhaps a dozen knobs, like very little buttons, but grooved and lined and huddling close to make room for one another. And among these buds were grey-green blades, scarce bigger than a hair almost, yet curving so as if their purpose was to shield the blossom. Other of the spur points, standing on the older wood where the sap was not so eager, had not burst their tunic yet, but were flayed and flaked with light, casting off the husk of brown in three-cornered patches, as I have seen a Scotchman's played, or as his legs shows through it. These buds, at a distance, looked as if the sky had been raining cream upon them. Now all this fair delight to the eyes, and good promise to the palate, was marred and baffled by the wind and cutting of the night frosts. The opening cones were struck with brown, in between the button buds and on the scapes that shielded them, while the foot part of the cover hung like rags, peeled back and quivering. And there the little stalk of each, which might have been a pear, God willing, had a ring around its base, and sought a chance to drop and die. The others which had not opened comb, but only prepared to do it, were a little better off, but still very brown and unkid, and shrivelling in doubt of health, and neither pert nor lusty. Now this I have not told because I know the way to do it, for that I do not, neither yet have seen a man who did know. It is wonderful how we look at things and never think to notice them, and I am as bad as anybody, unless the thing to be observed is a dog, or a horse, or a maiden. And the last of those three I look at somehow without knowing that I take notice, and greatly afraid to do it, only I knew afterwards, when the time of life was in me, not indeed what the maiden was like, but how she differed from others. Yet I have spoken about the spring, and the failure of fair promise, because I took it to my heart as token of what would come to me in the budding of my years and hope. And even then, being much possessed and full of a foolish melancholy, I felt a sad delight at being doomed to blight and loneliness. Not but that I managed still, when mother was urgent upon me, to eat my share of victuals, and cuff a man for laziness, and see that a ploughshare made no leaps, and sleep of a night without dreaming and my mother, half believing in her fondness and affection, that what the parish said was true about a mad dog having bitten me, and yet arguing that it must be false, because God would have prevented him. My mother gave me little rest when I was in the room with her, not that she worried me with questions, nor openly regarded me with any unusual meaning, but that I knew she was watching slyly whenever I took a spoon up, and every hour or so she managed to place a pan of water by me, quite as if by accident and sometimes even to spill a little upon my shoe or coat-sleeve. But Betty Muxworthy was the worst, for having no fear about my health, she made a villainous joke of it, and used to rush into the kitchen, barking like a dog, and panting, exclaiming that I had bitten her, and just as she would have on me if it cost her a twelve months' wages. And she always took care to do this thing, just when I had crossed my legs in the corner after supper, and leaned my head against the oven, to begin to think of Lorna. However, in all things there is comfort, if we do not look too hard for it, and now I had much satisfaction in my uncouth state, from labouring by the hour together, at the hedging and the ditching, meeting the bitter wind face to face, feeling my strength increase, and hoping that someone would be proud of it. In the rustling rush of every gust, in the graceful bend of every tree, 
even in the lords and ladies clumped in the scoops of the hedgerow and most of all in the soft primrose wrung by the wind but stealing back and smiling when the wrath was past in all of these and many others there was aching ecstasy delicious pang of lorna but however cold the weather was and however hard the wind blew one thing more than all the rest worried and perplexed me this was that i could not settle turn and twist as i might how soon i ought to go again upon a visit to glen doone for i liked not at all the falseness of it albeit against murderers and the creeping out of sight and hiding and feeling as a spy might and even more than this i feared how lorna might regard it whether i might seem to her a prone and blunt intruder a country youth not skilled in manners as among the quality even when they rob us for i was not sure myself but that it might be very bad manners to go again too early without an invitation and my hands and face were chapped so badly by the bitter wind that lorna might count them unsightly things and wish to see no more of them however i could not bring myself to consult any one upon this point at least in our own neighbourhood nor even to speak of it near home but the east wind holding through the month my hands and face growing worse and worse and it having occurred to me by this time that possibly lorna might have chaps if she came abroad at all and so might like to talk about them and show her little hands to me i resolved to take another opinion so far as might be upon this matter without disclosing the circumstances now the wisest person in all our parts was reckoned to be a certain wise woman well known all over exmoor by the name of mother meldrum her real name was maple durham as i learned long afterwards and she came of an ancient family but neither of devon nor somerset nevertheless she was quite at home with our proper modes of divination and knowing that we liked them best as each man does his own religion she would always practise them for the people of the country and all the while she would let us know that she kept a higher and nobler mode for those who looked down upon this one not having been bred and born to it mother meldrum had two houses or rather she had none at all but two homes wherein to find her according to the time of year in summer she lived in a pleasant cave facing the cool side of the hill far inland near hawkridge and close above tar steps a wonderful crossing of Baal river made as everybody knows by satan for a wager but throughout the winter she found sea air agreeable and a place where things could be had on credit and more occasion of talking not but what she could have credit for every one was afraid of her in the neighbourhood of tar steps only there was no one handy owning things worth taking therefore at the fall of the leaf when the woods grew damp and irksome the wise woman always set her face to the warmer cliffs of the channel where shelter was and dry fern bedding and folk to be seen in the distance from a bank upon which the sun shone and there as i knew from our john fry who had been to her about rheumatism and sheep possessed with an evil spirit and warts on the hand of his son young john any one who chose might find her towards the close of a winter day gathering sticks and brown fern for fuel and talking to herself the while in a hollow stretch behind the cliffs which foreigners who come and go without seeing much of exmoor have called the valley of rocks this valley or goyal as we term it being small for a valley lies to the west of linton about a mile from the town perhaps and away towards ley manor our home folk always call it the danes or the deans which is no more they tell me than a hollow place even as the word den is however let that pass for i know very little about it but the place itself is a pretty one though nothing to frighten anybody unless he hath lived in a gallipot it is a green rough-sided hollow bending at the middle touch this stone at either crest and dotted here and there with slabs in and out the brambles on the right hand is an upward crag called by some the castle easy enough to scale and giving great view of the channel facing this from the inland side and the elbow of the valley a queer old pile of rock arises bold behind one another and quite enough to affright a man if it only were ten times larger this is called the devil's cheese ring or the devil's cheese knife which mean the same thing as our fathers were used to eat their cheese from a scoop and perhaps in old time the utmost rock which has fallen away since i knew it was like to such an implement if satan eat cheese untoasted but all the middle of this valley was a place to rest in to sit and think that troubles were not if we would not make them to know the sea outside the hills but never to behold it only by the sound of waves to pity sailors labouring then to watch the sheltered sun coming warmly round the turn like a guest expected full of gentle glow and gladness casting shadow far away 
was a thing to hug itself, and awakening life from dew and hope from every spreading bud, and then to fall asleep and dream that the fern was all asparagus. Alas, I was too young in those days much to care for creature comforts, or to let pure palate have things that would improve it. Anything went down with me, as it does with most of us. Too late we know the good from bad. The knowledge is no pleasure, then, being memory's medicine, rather than the wine of hope. Now Mother Meldrum kept her winter in this vale of rocks, sheltering from the wind and rain within the devil's cheese ring, which added greatly to her fame, because all else, for miles around, were afraid to go near it after dark, or even on a gloomy day. Under eaves of lacquered rock she had a winding passage, which none that I ever knew of durst enter but herself and to this place I went to seek her, in spite of all misgivings, upon a Sunday in Lenten season, when the sheep were folded. Our parson, as if he had known my intent, had preached a beautiful sermon about the witch of Endor, and the perils of them that meddle wantonly with the unseen powers, and therein he referred especially to the strange noise in the neighbourhood, and upbraided us for want of faith, and many other backslidings. We listened to him very earnestly, for we like to hear from our betters about things that are beyond us, and to be roused up now and then, like sheep with a good dog after them, who can pull some wool without biting. Nevertheless, we could not see how our want of faith could have made that noise, especially at night-time, notwithstanding which we believed it, and hoped to do a little better. And so we all came home from church, and most of the people dined with us, as they always do on Sundays, because of the distance to go home, with only words inside them. The parson, who always sat next to mother, was afraid that he might have vexed us, and would not have the best piece of meat according to his custom. But soon we put him at his ease, and showed him we were proud of him, and then he made no more to do, but accepted the best of the sirloin. End of chapter 17 Read by Landy, in Sydney, Australia, September 2008